Hey everyone, welcome back to The Fin Factor. I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. And this is episode number 88. Aaron, do we have anyone number 88 in mind? Uh... Drawing a blank here. Some... Uh, there's like a Sasquatch sighting or something for 88. Can't remember exactly his name. Of course, Brent Burns, uh, number 88. So that is the episode we are on currently. And, uh, you know, again, we had said that we weren't going to be doing episodes unless we had some really good news or a nice guest. Aaron, do we have a guest that might want to do the show with us today? Yeah, I think Joe will. Joe who? Joe will. Oh, 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 Joe will. Yeah. GM of said. The- Very good. Joe will. Got it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, we are uh, back here and we've got Joe Will, the GM of the San Jose Barracuda joining us. Joe, thank you so much for popping in. Uh, we appreciate you uh, spending the time. Uh, it's, it's close to dinner time right now for us at least, so I'm sure uh, hopefully you guys have already eaten. But uh, again, thank you for sitting down with us. We appreciate that. Oh, no problem. It's always great to talk hockey. Nice. So uh, <laughs> before we talk hockey, we're going to talk a little bit of background. Uh, Aaron, you want to go ahead and take that one away? Sure. Joe, you started your career relatively early. You look like uh, you start with the Sharks, first of all, when they started in 1990. And then from what I gathered online, you also worked for the Minnesota North Stars for about six years before that, which is amazing. You have been working in the NHL for a very long time for a very relatively young man that you are. So I was pretty impressed with that. Now, a lot of people... Maybe a lot of people don't know who the Minnesota North Stars are. They got moved to Dallas and are now the Dallas Stars. But uh, you've been working there, man. So that puts you in, what, 36 years working in NHL affiliates? About that. That's that's incredible. It's uh, 30th year. (laughs) Uh, July 1st will be 30 years of the Sharks. That's great. That's amazing. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. (laughs) Coming up. Um, now, the AHL just announced, I, th- I believe it was last week, that they're going to be shutting down. Um, when will the re-signing of players start for the AHL season? Does that still need to wait until the NHL is completely either done for their season or ready for re-signing players themselves? Yeah, by rule for the AHL, we really could do it any time. We could uh, re-sign our, our players that are on expiring contracts in the NHL uh, that have AHL components to them or on AHL contracts, we could do that right now. It's just, you know, for us right now, uh, we've signed some of the players coming out of college and junior and in Europe that are going to join our team next year as far as re-signing for next year. This is traditionally when we're in the stage of, of talking about it internally, about who's coming back. Uh, we don't have a lot of guys with contracts up. It'll be, uh, um, you know, most of our guys are on, on multi-year contracts along with the players coming in. So we do have a few decisions, uh, not a lot of decisions. So, yeah, we've noted that down there too um, that we we're going to talk about a little bit later. Was There were not a lot of people that, that really needed to get re-signed. There's a couple RFAs. Um, some, like one I wanted to bring up was Jonathan Dolan. Now, he, mm-hmm. his dad was my favorite Sharks player when I first became a Sharks fan. In fact, his jersey is hanging up somewhere. Um, actually, I don't have it up right now. But, uh, yeah, I'm really excited for this guy. I'm hoping he comes back, and I was wondering if you had any insight on him coming back at all. Yeah, it's it's funny you talk about Alfdahl and uh, his, his father we actually traded for uh, when I was with the North Stars, and so he was a North Star, and then we uh, uh, he went on uh, to the Dallas Stars, and then we traded Doug Smolak. Uh, from the Sharks to the <laughs> Dallas Stars to get Alf Dolan back. And he was part of those runs uh, uh, in the early 90s that we had. So uh, Alf, he's a great friend. Uh, you know, we, we talk often. But, uh, yeah, his son Jonathan, uh, he, he be- he's became quite quite a good hockey player in Sweden. Uh, he played with Elias Pettersson a few years ago. Uh, they were They were very electric together. Uh, they both came over at the same time. Pedersen went into the NHL. Jonathan stayed in the uh, AHL for a while with Utica, and then we uh, traded for him. And, uh, you know, the first year went all right for him, um, and he wanted to kind of go back and get his game uh, back together a little bit in Sweden this year, and he did, and he did quite well. He had a, he had a tremendous year there for Timra, um, you know, 
brought the team to the top in that league and, and had uh, really electric stats this year. So we're, we're excited about, you know, the idea of, of Jonathan potentially coming back uh, in the not so distant future. We don't know right now. We're not really saying if it's going to be Sweden or here or wherever uh, we've talked with them. It's a flexible situation depending on basically where he could probably play the most hockey and, uh, and develop uh, properly. So it's, uh, we're not really, uh, you know, putting it on one or the other right now. We'll wait and see what happens. So, yeah, one of the things that uh, we were going to ask about actually was dealing with the the draft and the process that you have to go through now with all the remote technologies and whatnot. So if the, as opposed to the way you're doing it before, where it was a lot more, maybe say travel and whatnot, how has it changed with the, you know, the whole pandemic and having to do everything remotely, having to use some of the other technologies, the scouting being a lot different? Uh, can you speak on that a little bit? Well, we've actually been able to get a lot more time focused on the draft. Uh, it, you know, a lot of times this time of year we're, we're in the playoffs and, uh, you know, and so we're, we're focused on those games. We're focused on different things that we have, re-signings, other things. Right now, the amateur staff, it, it's really just the, the draft. So they're able to, you know, give a lot of time and effort into that right now. And they've been doing that for quite a while. As far as the technology goes, it's actually something you know we've we've been using for a long time. Um, we've been using the the platforms to where we can gather and and throw the the list up and have remote meetings because we have uh, we have scouts all over the world. It's a much easier format for us to use. So, you know, in this whole world of of Zoom and video conferencing, uh, we've been doing it for a while with our with our scouts. So they're they picked it up uh, quite easily, and and so it's kind of what we're used to. And, uh, you know, they're, they're more than ready, especially when we heard that there's an option that, you know, it could be potentially in June. And, and we don't know. It could be in June or it could be, you know, in the fall, whenever. Uh, but we're, we're planning that it's earlier than later just so that we're ready for it. So our, our guys are ready to go. And, and as far as the, you know, the, the rest gathering information, you know, about 80 to 90 percent of the regular season was done anyway. Some leagues were almost finished. So we, we did get a good basis of reports as to what we would get in any other draft here. We didn't get the playoffs. So that's a that's a little bit of a, a, a negative there. We do like to have playoff hockey, so you guys, you know, turn up there. Uh, we didn't get the combine. We didn't get the physical testing. However, certain programs and leagues and teams, they give us their own physical testing. So it's not quite the same as what the NHL does, but it's, it's, it's something. And then as far as the interviews go, um, that's really the same as normal. In fact, we, we're probably spending more time with prospects right now. We're able to get them on Zoom uh, as a group and talk to them, and, and uh, you know that's worked out quite well. And our our scouts throughout the year they they take the guys out for a, you know for a coffee or a, a lunch or something like that, and and talk with them throughout the year and get to know them. So you know the follow up this time of year is some Zoom calls just to see how they're doing and and you know get ready for the draft. Yeah, it seems like everybody. No matter which uh, sector you work in, they're all doing a lot more meetings nowadays. So, uh, sure. earning exempt from that. One of the questions that I had about uh, drafting, though, specifically is, I mean, obviously you're the the GM of the Barracuda. Doug Wilson's the GM of the San Jose Sharks. How much collaboration is there between the two, um, and, and does the drafting serve just to benefit the the Sharks? And, whatever is kind of there to develop goes to the Barracuda. Does some of the gaps maybe in the Barracuda's game get filled through the draft? Uh, specifically, they're picking a player to do that. H how does that collaboration work between uh, both GMs of both clubs? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, my, my first job, first and foremost, is uh, assistant GM for the Sharks. You know, working with the Barracuda is, is you know, part of the and uh, you know it's a it's a tool to get our, our players ready for the Sharks. As far as you know, populating the the roster of the Barracuda, it's it's the players that we draft for the Sharks, uh, along with some players that we sign as as veteran players to kind of help them along. So when I you know I put on my Sharks hat when I'm at the the draft table there, that is my background. What I started with the with the North Stars and and have continued on with the Sharks as my first job was scouting coordinator, you know, is, is being at the draft table and contributing wherever I can with the scouts and such, you know, and, and we are a 18 uh, year old draft. It's, it's interesting this year, we're drafting players born in 2000, 2001, and up to September 15th of uh, 2002. So it's, uh, it's very young players, uh, you know, only baseball and hockey 
draft players at young and even hockey more than baseball because baseball is going more towards college players right now as well. So, so we're, we're quite young a lot of the players that we see um, throughout the year. They're still 17 years old. In fact, we usually report on them a year before. So we have reports in the system on 16 year old players and 17 years old. And so, you know, that's why the backgrounds are so important. Uh, all the things are, are getting, you know, what type of, what type of people are they, um, you know, what's their, what's their physio makeup? How much are they going to grow? How strong are they going to get? Uh, you know, we have physiologists look, we, you know, talk to them about backgrounds and then looking at their hockey, you know, they, they play from leagues all over the world. So you have to, you have to balance somebody playing in high school from somebody playing on a top league in Russia. And you know, what, uh, uh, one might be lighting up the, the high school league, but the guy in Russia might be struggling as a third line, but it's a much better league. So it's, uh, you know, that's some of the interesting things we have to do as well. That's interesting. One of the questions I have is you guys do obviously you scout players, but do you have to scout other teams as well? Because there's a lot of times where the Sharks or anything will move up in the draft because there's a player that they like that's still available. So at what point do you kind of look around at the draft and go, okay, there's another five picks before us. We should draft up or we should trade up so we can draft that player you kind of have to know almost like the organizational depth chart of every other team in order to know if they are or are not going to take that player that you want. We do. I mean, it's, uh, it's part of it is, is figuring out who we want to take and then figuring out how we're going to get them. So like the draft table operations. So we'll look and see, you know, where players are rated, um, you know, in mock drafts where they're rated in central scouting, um, you know, history of players uh, from that program going, sometimes our scouts will say, Hey, you know what, there were 20 teams in there, you know, just kind of sniffing around when this player was playing. And, and so, you know, we get an idea of, of how, how much teams value them. And then, and then we also kind of, you know, keep note on, on who we see kind of watching them over and over again. So, you know, it's a, a little bit of a, a secrecy and, and things like that in our business that way, but, you know, it's just a little bit of, of extra intelligence that helps us going through figuring out where we need to select a player. And then we'll go through and, and look and say historically, uh, you know, what's happened in drafts before. And then we'll also, you know, see at that pick, if we have, if we're picking say 20th overall and it's up to 18th and we have five guys that are pretty equal, we'll pick one. But if there's only one left on the board, then we start to get a little bit nervous. If there's a drop to the next level, then sometimes we'll move up just to, you know, make sure that we get that particular player. Or if we rate them, you know, uh, a lot ahead of where, where we actually are slotted to pick. Gotcha. So they're kind of like in tiers in a way, different positions in different tiers. They are, they are. And so we'll, we'll have the tiers and when a tier drops off, we'll, we'll move back. So if we're, if we're pretty populated at that tier, we'll, we'll kind of hang in there. In fact, sometimes we'll even back up a little bit because we'll know that we have options in there and we can, uh, you know, squeeze out a little more value. So, uh, we, we look at value in the draft uh, whenever we can. You know, sometimes it's just, uh, you know, it's not all uh, according to, to, to the charts and such too, is, is sometimes we'll, we'll just, we will step up on somebody that, that we believe, uh, you know, the other ratings are maybe a little bit off on. Um, and so that happens at times too. But uh, for the most part, you know, we, we've discussed all the scenarios uh, well uh, before we, we actually go to the draft table. Yeah. So it's very much like fantasy sports. It is. It actually is. It's, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of that, a lot of preparation, a lot of fun, kind of sitting there trying to think on your feet and everything else and, and going and, and uh, uh, you know, talking to other teams. And, and that's interesting, too, because sometimes they'll, they'll come and, and try and find us. And, and that's where you'll, you'll value, like, if, they, if you're sitting there at, at pick 38 and they offer up 45 and then a, and then a third-round pick to boot, you know, you'll say – uh, unless somebody's really high in that tier, it's pretty tempting, and 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 you'll move back. So, so it all depends on what other teams are doing as well. Yeah, that, that stuff has always been so interesting to me. How like I know you always you hear Doug Wilson always say, well, we don't talk about you know contract negotiations and the way that we do trades and all that. We don't talk about any of that stuff. So um, you can only get so much out of the, the heads. And hearing it from you, it's, it's kind of get a better understanding of. Not specifics, like Doug kind of guards the specifics, but getting kind of those general 
um, you know, things that are happening at the table, uh, the, the tears like you just talked about, um, hearing about that is just really, really interesting to me. So I think Aaron's trying to uh, get better at the NHL 20 there, though. I think that's that's what he's going for. So <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> for my that's... fantasy league team. <laughs> so, it's um, funny. We're, we're talking about the uh, some of the virtual hockey out there now, too, and we're talking to uh, – uh, Jasper Weatherby, who's uh, one of our prospects at the University of North Dakota. And uh, so there was no NCAA tournament, but uh, one of the sites, I think College Hockey News, they had a simulated tournament. So he scored a really big goal in one of those simulated games. So we had him on a call uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about how big that goal was. And he goes, yeah, everybody was calling him and, and, and talking to him about that. So that's that's the point we're at now is, is uh, talking about big goals in uh, simulation yeah. hockey. Yeah, I saw um, the Sharks did um, uh, NHL 20 game against, uh, I don't know, the Hurricanes or somebody, I forget who it was, but uh, they had Dan Rusinowski actually uh, officiating, not officiating, uh, um, doing the, the color commentary and everything, the play-by-play -play, uh, on virtual uh, hockey. It was, it was just so awesome to see and so great to hear his voice again because it's, it's been a while. So, um, yeah. oh, along that same kind of vein, um, is, is the Barracuda mostly focused then on just development? I think it's kind of what you're saying is – uh, the, the really the point is to kind of develop those players and, and preparation to get them ready for uh, moving forward. Yeah, it's, it is, it's, you know, we're, we're focused on, on basically, you know, just getting that pro time at a, at a high level, uh, a high league, getting ready for the, for the NHL. And it's the time when players can come in and, and learn their craft, try things, make some mistakes along the way, everything else. And, and kind of, uh, you know, get used to playing with, with quicker, stronger uh, players, uh, sometimes a chaotic environment. You know, it's, it's, you play, it's a, the, the AHL is a tough league. And, and if you can play well in the AHL and you can, can get up to a high level, it, it's going to be really uh, get, get you ready for the, uh, for the NHL. So it's much like, much like AAA baseball in that sense, you're almost there, but you're, you're a little bit uh, uh, behind. And, you know, it tells you the, the level. We had 16 players this year play for both the Sharks and the Barracuda. So, you know, it shows players playing at the Barracuda level, they're, they're close. You know, 16 of them were that close that they're able to, to come up and play some games. Yeah, I know. And, and the reason I had brought that up actually is because there's this really interesting uh, rule with the AHL in terms of the rostered players. Of the 18 skaters, 13 of them have to be considered development players. And then uh, the rest of them, I guess, could be uh, like of an older age or can have more games played, which kind of uh, shows the value of a guy like John McCarthy, who's now retired and is, is coaching, of course. But he played with the, the Worcester Sharks and the San Jose Barracuda for quite a long time and is a guy that has a lot of games played. So you take a look at a guy like that and the guys that you're bringing in uh, that do a lot of the, they have to have a lot of development done. And you see some of the leadership qualities that John McCarthy brings to kind of help these guys get through and push through to that next level. So um, for me, it was just kind of interesting to see that rule. I didn't really, I didn't realize that, that they have to have a certain number of games played or less. So are there complications sometimes with maybe a guy that you really like but he's played close to that number of games and you can't afford to have him on the roster anymore. I mean, not a specific name necessarily, but do that, does that rule kind of add complications? Um, it, it can, it depends on the organization for us. It, it traditionally hasn't. Uh, we, we've went with a lot of our younger players in there. Uh, a, a lot of times in markets, uh, you know, established AHL markets or independent owners where there's a, a player that's, you know, kind of connected to the, uh, to the community, like, uh, more John McCarthy's perhaps, uh, they'll, they'll sign them. They usually have more games and you're, and you're allowed up to, up to five players, six, uh, you, you get one exception. So five or six players, uh, you know, with, uh, with the 320 games, uh, played or more. And, uh, uh, for us, it, it really hasn't been an issue there, but but we do really value players with experience like John McCarthy and, and others. You have to find that balance because you can't if you put a lot of the young guys out there without mentors and things like that to, uh, you know, to help them along. It's 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 a harder goal for them. So John McCarthy, we we're very uh, you know, fortunate to have him for all the years that we had him as a player and now having him as a coach. 
that, you know, he's been just a great mentor uh, to our players. So, you know what, we're going to, we're going to have to replace him. We're going to have to find other guys out there. A lot of times they do, they're guys that you've had for a long time in your organization. And you say, you know what, uh, um, they're, they're just players you don't want to let go. They, they just do things the right way. Uh, they treat people the right way, represent the organization properly, and, and we're in sync with them. And often they're the people that end up working for you at the at the end of their run too, like like John is. So it's uh, um, you know we those players are very 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 valuable. Go ahead, Aaron. Getting up here. <laughs> uh, well, let's let's talk about the Worcester Sharks before they moved here. Um, obviously, there's some there's some drawback having the affiliate on the East coast when the sharks are on the West coast, was there any benefit to having the Worcester sharks around uh, being on the wet, on the East coast compared to now moving over here? Well, outside of being here, it was probably as good of an area as you could get because everything is, is so close. Like we were able to, to play Portland, Maine, Manchester, New Hampshire, Providence, Rhode Island, Hartford, Springfield, Mass. It, you know, everything was within two hours. So it, it was a, you know, a bus league. That's why it was originally set up that way. The international, when I came in, we had the International Hockey League, which was, you know, like in the Michigan, uh, you know, Illinois, Indiana area. And uh, for, for Western Conference NHL teams, and you had the AHL, uh, which you know is for Eastern Conference NHL teams, and it was really pretty much a New England league. And uh, well, so when we were out there, it was great. It's hockey area, um, you know, traditional area and such, and it was all close. But it was so hard for recalls, and so hard for you know Doug and and me and and our coaches to to go and watch our, our prospects, and especially at that time, you know, uh, streamed hockey was not as prevalent and when we used it, it was buffering all the time and everything else or, or videos were always delayed. So, um, you know, we, we couldn't do it by ourselves. We said, are we going to be, you know, all the other teams out in New England and we'd be in San Jose? Well, that'd be really impractical. So that's at that point, uh, Doug, uh, you know, started talking to uh, the, the Kings and the Ducks and, and uh, Oilers and, and Calgary and, and, started creating this this division out here with the general managers and and our owner loved it you know uh, hustle Plotner, he was really on board with that he goes you know uh he asked that question quite often you know can we be all closer to home and uh and supported the move and kind of set that out and and it's been a it's been a big hit and in fact teams are really kind of following that vegas just uh left chicago and, and they actually they're putting their affiliate in henderson nevada and uh you know uh phoenix before that arizona uh, they moved their affiliate to Tucson, Colorado, moved their affiliate right there about a 45 minutes north of Denver. So I think, you know, back when we were at one point with the Worcester Sharks, I think about 11 teams were, were in the footprint of their NHL club. Uh, and now I think it's, it's about 23 or 24 AHL teams are in the footprint, meaning they're, they're close enough that the fans are going to be the same for the NHL and the AHL and, and, and you can almost drive there and such. So, so I think our division coming out here kind of started a movement and, and, uh, we're, we're more of the norm than the exception. Yeah, that's awesome. Did their attendance kind of boost up for the AHL for those teams because they are closer to their NHL affiliate fans? I think in a lot of markets it, it has, and and uh, you know, and for us it's it's still kind of a a challenge, but that's one of the reasons why we're building the Barracuda Arena, uh, you know, connected uh, right to Solar for America Ice, and uh, you know, part of it is a fifth and sixth rank for our uh, grassroots hockey in the area, and uh, and and then the other other part is a home for the Barracuda. Uh, right now, SAP Center, I mean, we have the Sharks, we have a lot of major concerts, we have major events, we have the Barracuda. It's a busy, busy building, and it's quite large for, for the AHL. I mean, it works. It's a great home for us in that way, but, you know, traditional minor league, a little smaller facility with some minor league amenities and things like that in there, um, you know, we're really looking forward to the new arena. Yeah, that's actually my next question about the new arena. Do you have any updates on it or any uh, any progress on it? Yeah, it's uh, uh, everything I've heard is that, you know what, uh, we're, we're moving forward with things on there. I mean, like everything else, there's been delays in, in there. But I think one of the things that it, it appears that they're doing in this uh, 
uh, pandemic is construction is one of the first things to kind of open up. So I think that the plan is, is to move ahead as soon as it, it can be safely done. But the plan is to to stay on a course with this project. I think they were they were kind of uh, uh, you know in the planning stages uh, on, on an every you know anyway in the prep stages and such. And and I would uh, I would expect that uh, you know this fall is is when they'll be able to kind of. You know, get going on that part, but uh, John Gustafson, who is our our uh, governor of the Barracuda and 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 runs all of our properties in the company, uh, that's his project, and and uh, uh, they're ready to move ahead. That's great. Actually, my wife is from uh, the Boston area, and we've been we've been together since two thousand seven. So I've actually been to some Worcester games, and it was frigid in Worcester. It is colder than most parts of uh, New England. I should, well, maybe not all of New England, but Massachusetts. But I did go and get this shirt. And oh, I, I still love wear it. it. That's great. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. a classic. <laughs> That's, uh, That's great. Um, I mean, I was, I was happy, obviously, that they moved closer to here, but um, it was fun to go make the trek out to Worcester every every time we go out there and visit family. So, uh that was I'll, I'll miss that, but I won't miss the cold. I, I, that's probably one of the coldest I think I've ever been. And you know, I'm a California boy, so I'm kind of a wuss anyway. <laughs> well, it does it does get cold. It's uh, a lot of fond memories. So if it, you know, you ask uh, Louis Tour and and a number of our, our sharks now that played in Worcester, they 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 love the experience there. And again, it's with that cold and everything else. It's you get some some real hockey frigid weather and and. Uh, uh, the atmosphere is great. Uh, there, there were great fans there, great sports fans. Uh, the Red Sox actually just moved their uh, AAA affiliate from uh, Providence, Rhode Island to uh, or Pawtucket, Rhode Island to Worcester. So I think another year out, they, they have a nice AAA stadium. So they, uh, uh, but I do know they miss the Worcester Sharks. They still follow us. Uh, hear from their their fan club is kind of still going, and their their media and such. They they check in on our players all the time, and and they. Uh, they missed us when we left the area. Yeah, I have to imagine. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> really having uh, the arena to themselves instead of having to share uh, SAP ice. I know there's been a lot of complaints. Um, maybe not so much directly from the players, but you hear a lot of times, oh, the ice wasn't good tonight. And it's generally on a night where there's a back-to-back with the Cuda and the Sharks playing on the, on the same ice at home. So it would definitely be nice to kind of – have their own separate uh, homes, if you will, and I'm I'm definitely looking forward to the progress uh, for that, that uh, building getting completed. It looks like from all the mock-ups that I've seen, it looks really really impressive. What did, what do you think so far from the mock-ups you've seen? Oh, uh, just just amazing. You know, the size is right for it. The ambiance within there, you can you can fill the arena. Nothing like a, a, a filled arena in there, uh, and we'll be able to do that because we'll be able to get prime dates. You know, dates at uh, you know Saturday nights or or afternoon games or whatever. You know, minor leagues a little bit different, so we'll be able to adjust it that way. But the uh, you know the food and beverage kind of goes along with that. The promotions, the uh, you know the the birthday parties, the things you do at, at minor league sports that are you know borderline obnoxious, that, that you know, just a little bit different than 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 the, the pro sports or than the, you know the major sports in a sense, and and it's uh, uh, we're just uh, uh, really really looking forward to it. Uh, we think it'll bring more people to the game of hockey. You know, it, it might be a stepping stone for somebody's first hockey game. It might not be their Sharks. They might go to the Barracuda and then they become a Sharks fan. Ultimately, uh, we almost look at, at the Barracuda property as, as development for not only our players, but for our staff and for fans as well to, to you know, just bring more people into the sport. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, I, I, I wouldn't even, uh, I wouldn't call it what you call it necessarily, but I, I think it's it's been awesome. It's been a great experience. I wouldn't call it corny at all. Um, it, it, having the kids going out there and having a great time, the chuck a puck, the kids club, um, all that stuff. It's just been really such a great time. Um, I, I go out there and I have a lot of fun with it too. When they're scoring goals and everyone's doing the you know, the frenzy and everything, it's it's just a really great time. So I think you guys have done a marvelous job with it, and I'm really looking forward to what you guys can do with the arena. That is uh, your own Cuda Country. Uh, man, wait till this new barn gets thrown up. It's going to be awesome. You love it. So uh, one last thing. Me at least, uh, is it is it kind of maybe unique um, to have an AHL club and an NHL club both be kind of very competitive and equally as unique to have them uh, be both not very competitive? 
Um, you would think that if a team is uh, AHL team is really good, that those players would be moved up into the to the NHL and get their seasoning. Uh, and that if an NHL team is uh, really good, then maybe they don't have a great draft position. So um, is it maybe a, a different, uh, a weird scenario, maybe that a team might have, um, well, an AHL and NHL uh, combination uh, tandem would have both very good records or both very poor records? Yeah, it, it's funny. I've, I've looked at that a lot. It, it depends on the organization and kind of how, how you build your team. I, I think, you know, speaking for the for the Barracuda this year, it was it was a little bit of, of just maybe lack of savvy in the in the first part of the year. Um, you know, with uh, quite a few young guys in the lineup, uh, we pulled up some coaches. Uh, you know, to the NHL, um, John McCarthy had a, a career-ending uh, um, medical situation and such. So we had some uh, strange things happen. At the same time, uh, you know, the young players they were there were certain games that you know we we came out. I think we had a had like a, a seven nothing or nine nothing game or something to where we were just uh, you know like like really dominant skills wise and, and passing it around. We struggled in in uh, one goal leads and the one goal um, uh, deficits throughout the year in in just those type of veteran savvy things that young players kind of overlook at times. You know they're 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 just not they're they're not focused on that. Focused just more on kind of wide open hockey and such. Um, that, that's, that's kind of my take on it this year is that, uh, we didn't learn a lot of the savviness on how to win those close games until the latter parts of the year. Uh, our last 13 games, we got points in 11 of them. Our last six games, we got points in all of them. And our last game, we, we beat, uh, Stockton who had always been a, uh, they're, they're, uh, a little bit older, more vet, uh, savvy team, seven to four. So we're trending in the right direction, kind of overcoming those things. And that was more of a function, I think, uh, of youth. And at the same time that they were coming, a lot of the players were taking that were responsible for that. They were kind of being pulled up to the Sharks, you know, to get a little bit of a taste, to get them ready for next year, uh, to get a look, you know, to see, you know, it's not only to develop them, but it's to evaluate them a little bit when they get recalled. And, uh, uh, you know, that was a, another good part of our year. But the, the record wasn't good this year, but it was just kind of one of those years where we just kind of ran out of time. By the time we got around to getting everything the way that we wanted it in that way. And, you know, Sharks was just a, a little uh, different different scenario where, where different things happened. Uh, uh, training camp was probably didn't start out all that great, and we were just up and down throughout the year. And every time we got momentum, something kind of knocked it off track. But uh, uh, but you know, it's it's interesting comparison watching the trends on on both teams. A lot of times, what you will see is a team that's really really uh, good in the American Hockey League. You know, that goes up through the playoffs with with young uh, good prospects within there. You'll see that in the next couple of years in the NHL. And, and uh, in, I think it was the 2017 AHL playoffs where the Barracuda went three rounds in and ended up playing Grand Rapids in the Western Conference Finals. That was, you know, Timo Meyer and a and, and number of the players uh, on there, uh, Kevin LeBanc, Marcus Sorensen. I think there were 12 or 13 players that all went to the NHL. And a lot of those players were on the, on the roster of the Western Conference final team in, in the NHL in uh, 2019. So two years later, you know they they were in uh, they went from one league to the other you know same level of playoffs so that's usually what we see when we look at it or, or that's what we would like to see so that's great uh, before I let you go I want to ask who are your top three guys that you think are going to take big steps for the Barracuda next season there's there's quite a few um, and and some of them were up at the uh, sharks at the end, so like it's it's kind of a, a blurred line. Uh, Noah Gregor was was really good, uh, you know, at the end of the year with the sharks. He ended up kind of staying up there. Um, you know, our, our rookie of the year was Joachim Blickfeld. I think Sasha Chimleski is going to take a a big jump. You're going to see Ryan Merkley in there next year. You're going to see some new players in 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 uh, uh, John Leonard, who was a uh, leading goal scorer in the NCAA hockey this year. And Brinson Pasichuk, who was a, a you know, all American defenseman at uh, Arizona state. Um, you're going to see hopefully uh, Joseph Kornar uh, have a bounce back year with talking with them. I certainly expect that along with, uh, you know, a new goalie and Alexei uh, 
Melnichuk. So there's there's quite a few players. It, it's hard to hard to pinpoint one. I'm usually always wrong if I kind of stick with that. So I'm mentioning you know a lot of the players here, but I, I think I think we're going to have a high level of internal competition, which I think will really kind of help our, our record and 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 results next year. Um, you know if uh, um, if everything else is the same, but uh, uh, I, I'm I'm pretty bullish about next year. Awesome. That's great. I'm excited. My kids are part of the Barracuda Kids fan club, so we will oh, be perfect. going to quite a few games next season. <laughs> well, that's yeah. great. Same here. Yeah, we got the uh, the bubbles. We got the shirts. We got the uh, glasses about 15 times over because they keep spinning the wheel and winning the glasses. But, oh, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. We got, I got a whole wall full of just orange shades. I'm telling you. So we got to win oh, some wristbands. Yeah. I have no idea. Anyway. Uh, Joe, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we do appreciate all your time answering all of our questions and whatnot. Um, Aaron, anything else you want to say real quick here? Or? No, just thanks for coming on the show, and uh, we appreciate all your insight. Uh, a- anytime, guys. Really appreciate it. And, uh, um, you know, it's a, again, love talking hockey about our prospects or about the, the Barracuda or Sharks. So, so anytime. Awesome stuff. Again, thanks so much. We appreciate you uh, spending your time with us. Guys, that is it for this edition of The Fin Factor. So we do appreciate you uh, tuning in and checking this out. Hopefully you had a good time uh, listening to all the things that Joe had to say here. So with that, uh, I am Paul. And I'm Aaron. (laughs) And that's Joe Will. And we will see you guys (laughs) next time. Next time. (laughs) Bye bye. Bye. Excellent job. (laughs) Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, check out our other content, especially interviews. You can interact with us directly through social media at The Fin Factor and on Instagram at Fin Factor. And don't forget to join our live streams on YouTube. Visit our website at TheFinFactor.com where you'll find all of our episodes as videos or podcasts. You'll also find our exclusive merchandise to help support our show.